Daily Tech News Show is made possible by its listeners. Thanks to all of you, including DeGracia A. Daniels, Erwin Sturr, and Ken Hayes. Coming up on DTNS, GPUs are in abundance. Prices are plummeting, but... Is that true for the card you actually want? Patrick Norton's going to tell us. Plus, the Twilio breach gets worse and worse. And our best guess at why you won't want to buy Meta's new VR headset this October. This is the Daily Tech News for Friday, August 26th, 2022 in Los Angeles. I'm Tom Merritt. And from Studio Redwood, I'm Sarah Lane. Oh, we can't hear you, Patrick Norton, but somewhere in Portland is Patrick Norton, who (laughs) muted himself so he wouldn't cough earlier. And then, yeah, it's all good. Podcasts are hard, Tom. (laughs) (laughs) And Len. Drawing the top tech stories, I'm Len Peralta from Cleveland. And I'm the show's producer, Roger Chang. (laughs) It's Friday, and a bunch of people tried to convince us Amazon wanted to buy EA, and then a bunch of other people tried to convince us they won't, and Amazon isn't saying anything. That's not news, but this following stuff are a few tech things you should know. This one. (laughs) Friday. (laughs) LastPass confirmed threat actors breach its developer environment through a single compromised developer account, ultimately accessing source code and technical information. There's no evidence that customer data or encrypted password vaults were compromised. T-Mobile announced a partnership with SpaceX to connect phones to its Starlink satellite internet service. This coverage above and beyond, as they are calling it, setup uh, will provide a combined two to four megabit per section per per second connection uh, in the areas that it covers. That that would be enough uh, if it works to let someone with a clear view of the sky send a text message or two. Uh, eventually, they say they want to try to offer voice and data. After Starlink launches some second gen satellites with larger antennas next year, T-Mobile will launch the service in beta in select areas. It will use its existing mid band spectrum, so most current phones will work with it. It will also work with Tesla vehicles, and they hope to add partners in other countries along the way. Google has two main operating systems, uh, Android and Chrome OS. So for years, folks have been wondering what Google might do with a third OS, that one being Fuchsia, which it built from the ground up. 9to5 Google now reports that Google has rolled out Fuchsia to all Nest Hubs and Nest Hub Maxes. The only change that users are likely to notice from this is the addition of a Bluetooth menu in settings. The Nest Hub second gen would look to be in line to get Fuchsia as well. It was a big day for Twitter. Uh, Chancellor Kathleen McCormick of Delaware's Court of Chancery, that's what they call a judge in the Court of Chancery, a chancellor, uh, said Elon Musk's demands for user data were, and I quote, absurdly broad. Uh, And that what Twitter has agreed to give him is, quote, sufficiently broad to satisfy most of plaintiff's obligations. Now, the judge did order Twitter to hand over data from 9,000 accounts that it sampled in Q4 in order to estimate spam or bot users, and it has two weeks to do that. That is the data that Twitter used to estimate that 5% of its accounts were bots. That's the number they've been banding about. So the chancellor said, give the data you use to come up with the 5% to Musk's side. Twitter Musk trial starts on October 17th. But that's not all. Twitter founder Jack Dorsey tweeted that his biggest regret, quote, is that it became a company. Dorsey <laughs> believes uh, Twitter should be a protocol, like email. I actually kind of get this. It's funny the way you put it, though. Uh, and Twitter announced it's integrating podcasts into the Spaces tab for English-speaking audiences on mobile. Spaces hubs called Stations will now include popular podcasts, as well as the live and recorded Spaces rooms it does now. Desktop support for podcasts and Spaces will depend on how well this does. Chattanooga, Tennessee's Municipal Utility, EPB, has provided gigabit municipal fiber internet since 2010. So it has a new trick. EPB announced on August 24th it will offer residential and business customers a symmetrical 25 gigabit per second plan. If you're keeping score, this is the fastest multi-gigabit broadband service currently available in the U.S. The plan will only be available to everybody in EPB's 600-square-mile service area, so room to grow. Uh, But boy, if you live there, It's limited. That's the problem with municipal broadband. 
Sure, they'll give you 25 times the gigabit that I yeah, can't actually get if, in my if neighborhood. If you only live in a 600-square-mile <laughs> radius. Only. I have so many rude things to not say right now, Tom. <laughs> <laughs> no, I feel you, man. I feel you. Um, so, uh, do you see us moving to Chattanooga? I don't know. Maybe so. I, I mean, it sounds pretty good. <laughs> All right, let's talk a little more about uh, that VR headset coming from Meta. Meta CEO Mark Zuckerberg appeared on the Joe Rogan Experience podcast that came out on Thursday. He said a lot. Uh, he said a lot about how much it sucks to try to moderate almost 3 billion people. I'm sure you all feel real bad for him. Yeah, uh, I but know, he, did, it sucks. That's he didn't I'm... really say anything particularly insightful on that topic, although he's getting quoted everywhere. Uh, nothing you wouldn't predict, he would say, is the way I would look at it. But here's what he said about VR. Yeah, so Meta will launch a new VR headset in October, according to Zuckerberg, which is when Meta's Connect conference takes place. So that would make sense. It would be a successor to the Oculus 2 and also have features meant to give users a feeling of social presence. Again, says Zuckerberg. It will have eye and facial tracking. Virtual avatars will be able to reflect facial movements. Zuck didn't say exactly if Project Cambria had said that that is something that the company has said that they've been working on for some time and announced at last year's Connect conference is the same headset, but it seems like it probably is. More poetically, back in May, the information sources described it as a Chromebook for the face. <laughs> we may know the name, too. Bloomberg sources rep reported in July that Meta's VR app for iOS had references to a Meta Quest Pro. Zuckerberg also said augmented reality glasses a few years away still. All right. So, but the, the rumor has been that this thing might cost around 800 bucks. It's going to be a Chromebook for the face called the MetaQuest Pro uh, and will allow you to feel social presence. Uh, Patrick, are you ready to feel social presence? <laughs> You're asking the wrong guy. I know it. Oh, my goodness. First of all, I'm still trying to imagine anybody uh, selling products anywhere is describing something as a Chromebook for the face. Um, I just, to be clear, I just, that was sources telling information. That's not the official marketing plan. But yeah, yeah, I got you. <laughs> you know what I mean? But it's like if if sources said that, they either really hate this product or, boy, this is going to be a fanciful marketing campaign, the likes of which we can't imagine. Um, I, you, you know, good day, Internet, pre-show, talking with Sarah. I, I think we're both like social presence. So you're going to you're yeah. going to bring what is this going to mean? We're like, we're all going to be sitting in a conference room with our, you know, 3D present avatar, giant dragon faces, cats, memes, whatever it is. When you raise your eyebrow, your meeting. avatar will raise its eyebrow, Patrick. I mean, you know, yeah. and, I'm and sitting, that's how I, you know you're mad in a meeting. I, I, I've, I've been joking for years at the whole point about Facebook buying Oculus originally now meta creating meta or the metaverse is because, you know, we're bringing virtual makeouts to the internet, but you know, this is just, I, I just, what are they, what is their plan here? What is, where are they going with this? Can they make it say, I don't know. It just seems like, um, it's just, you know, really, this is, this is the plan, not more games, not more accessibility, not making it more affordable, not actually doing things people want it to do well, now. In fact, the Oculus two just got a price hike. I, you know, I'm, I'm with you on this, Patrick. I, I you know, when I say, uh, when I, when I hear social presence, it's like, oh, okay. So I actually, I have uh, a meta uh, quest too. I use it often. Um, <laughs> anybody who <laughs> listens to the show knows that I do. I don't really use the social aspects of it, but I know that they're there and that's, you know, that's cool. That's fine. Uh, I feel like the whole like idea of social presence, at least from what Meta has teased thus far, right. is all about, you know, we're virtual and now we're in meetings and this is, you know, we're doing business and this is going to be the future of business. I do not see that at all. I think it's like a cartoonish version of business that nobody asked for. Right. I, I think I'm I think they're making a common mistake here because the idea of being able to have your avatar track your facial expression is absolutely beneficial. You you sure. do communicate non-verbally and being able to communicate non-verbally in VR will be essential. He's not wrong about any of that, but it's not the next step, right? Uh, it's like selling a touchscreen tablet because you can touch it. Microsoft did that. They got up on stage at CES and said, look, it's a tablet and I can touch it. Uh, 
people are like, great, what do I do with the, with that? Apple came along and said, look, it's an iPhone in a bigger form factor and look at all the things you can do with it that right. you can touch it. Uh, and they had already demonstrated what you could do with multi-touch. He's thinking everybody wants to have virtual meetings. I'm not sure that's true. <sighs> yeah, I mean, at I'm, least not I'm making it. Uh, well, a, but and even if they do, we don't need to do it with avatars. That well, could that could what, work in what certain else would you do, situations. Then? Live video you conferencing would, yeah, that works just, perfectly well to allow us if you yeah. you know the, for eight hundred dollars you could produce a pretty badass camera I'm, I'm, and a no, decent I'm, headset. I'm saying you know having virtual meetings where there's three D and you have an avatar. Sure, I, I think there are companies that would benefit from that. But I don't know that that's something companies are are prioritizing right I, now because of what you said about like you know what maybe Zoom isn't quite that rich of an experience, but it's good enough at least for now. Well, I mean, most of the challenges with Zoom have to deal with figuring out the protocol of having twenty five people in a room, or the fact that you have people who are sitting there like I'm using the microphone and the speakers in my laptop in a room that is all hard walls and there's all this reflective echo and I've got this crappy camera and I have no light, right? If you invest some money in, you know, putting a lamp there, having a light, putting, you know, an earbud in or something. Hey, it if you have an avatar, you don't have to do all that stuff. Uh, yes, you just need an immensely powerful computer and an eight hundred dollar headset. Need a Chromebook on your face. Well, so, and me, can, your avatar has to look like you, and the whole thing is I don't know. I mean, there's when 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 I th when I think about you know it, probably the only time anywhere at any time I'm going to say you know I'm really sharing this feeling, this opinion, this thought space with Kim Kardashian and Kylie Jenner, right? But when they reshared, I think it was uh, Taddy Bruning's post where she was just like, just let Instagram be Instagram. Right. This company that has basically said, we're just going to do what we need to do with Instagram to make Instagram TikTok. And if you don't like it, well, whatever, because we're going to make revenue. And now they're going to, you know, now they're going to sort of like convince everybody to move into this. I just, I feel like, you know, Facebook has had a, making new products problem for years now and now it's like right at the time they're stomping on these incredibly evolved and incredibly entrenched social environments they're like yeah revenue algorithm competition you know screw what we've built we're going to force this into where we need it to be and again like it's i just don't i don't see a lot of people trusting or wanting to invest in this as a business tool tom that, much less that, as a that, social environment that is different than the the tech itself not being useful. I think the tech itself is perfectly useful and will be exactly where virtual avatars go and there will be a use for virtual avatars. I just, I, I totally agree with you that there's not a business case or a desire for it yet. You have to build the ramp to that and have people start right. using it before you give them the improvement, right? They're, they're, the polishing, that... they're polishing the banister before they've built the house. <laughs> I mean, at this point, it's, you know, just to snark one last time, it's so good that Facebook has done, excuse me, Meta has done such a job of building a trust between its user base and their belief that the products they invest in will continue to deliver on the promise that they, you know what I mean? Like you, you create this environment and this thing and you're like, yeah, we're going to jerk this hard right. Sorry if you don't like the cliff we're heading off of, but that's where we're going. Like, I, you know, I mean, they, they're not helping themselves in these larger attempts to move the conversations or the place where the conversations are held on the internet if they keep sort of screwing over their user base. Yeah. Well, speaking of users being screwed over. <laughs> what a transition. A huge, Sorry. A huge hat tip goes to TechCrunch's Carly Page, who's been doing excellent work covering the Twilio attack, which, as Lando might say, gets worse and worse all the time. So, Tom, give us a little background here. Yeah. Uh, Twilio, if you don't know, is most famous for helping companies, big companies, including Facebook and Uber, manage customer text messaging. Uh, these include things like sending you a second factor over SMS, so not just marketing mails. We're, we're talking about important customer direct communication. Twilio is a respected company. However, on August 8th, Twilio announced that attackers had fished login credentials from employees and accessed customer data for, they thought, 125. They now say about 
about 163 customers. Twilio did not publicize the company names, though some, like Signal, have notified users that they were a victim. If you're curious, here's how that phishing attack worked. It looks like the attackers used data aggregation services that anybody can go to and pay money to get a hold of employee names and phone numbers that are associated with each other. They then sent targeted employees of Twilio text messages saying things like, your password has expired, or your schedule has changed. Click here to log in. And of course, that link went to a malicious site that captured the login credentials. Twilio worked with carriers and web hosts to stop the messages from being sent and shut down the malicious website. However, Thursday, single sign-on provider Okta noticed that when the attackers had access to Twilio, they were able to access a small number of Okta customers' one-time passwords. Yeah, and so even after being shut out of Twilio, the attackers kept rotating their accounts and targeting companies that used Okta's services. Singapore-based security company Group IB told TechCrunch, it believes that the attackers have compromised 9,931 accounts at 130 companies since March, mostly in the U.S., Group IB also believes that one participant in the attacker group may live in North Carolina. DoorDash has confirmed that attackers gained access, access to its internal tools and customers and drivers' names, emails, phone numbers, and delivery addresses. The company didn't say how many accounts were accessed, but they said it was a small percentage. DoorDash told TechCrunch that in this case, the attackers fished credentials from a third-party vendor that was not Twilio. Yeah, so this group is attacking a lot of different companies. And one of those was multi-factor authentication code manager Authy. Twilio confirmed that Authy, Authy was affected by the Twilio breach. Attackers were able to access the accounts of 93 users and register additional devices. Authy mm. provides a service that lets you keep your multi-factor codes in sync on multiple devices. For those 93 accounts, attackers would have been able to add a device and then see the multi-factor codes for any accounts managed through Authy. If they also had the passwords for those accounts, then they would have been able to get in. Authy has since identified and removed the suspicious devices and advised affected users to disable multi-device support and review devices on their account. If you're an Authy user, probably a good idea for you to go into your app and look at what devices are associated as well if you use the multi-device thing or maybe just turn it off altogether. It's convenient. Uh, uh, but I'm an Authy user, so uh, yeah. Suspect to, you know, it's susceptible to this kind of attack. Now, it's it's tempting to say like how horrible all these companies are, but frankly, this is a pretty mundane phishing attack. Uh, the attackers right. figured out a good juicy target uh, and they got lucky and got in. The, the weakness is always the people, right, Patrick? Patrick, you were whistling earlier, um, I think. <laughs> I, I, it was just it being <laughs> think, inside of Authy. I, I was just, I, I was literally, yeah, yeah. you know, I was one of the people that got an email from LastPass this morning, uh, which is, you know, a, a, a nightmare I've been waiting yeah, we to all have. Do. Yeah, you, sorry. I, I, you know what I mean? I, I've, been, I've been terrified that I would get that email for years now because it's But that was source code of their... Uh, of their product, not yeah. the passwords. Just to repeat I that, agree. I know Sarah said that earlier. No, no, and I appreciate that, but it was still that first, like, that first getting that email, and then you have to digest it, and then mm -hmm. your brain finally clicks on and goes, okay, it's source code, which is bad, because people use mm -hmm. source code to try to look for flaws, but it's not like they accessed, you know, so many important things in my life, right? Um, the Twilio thing here is just like, you know, this is this is painful, and I think I just started working at a new company, and one of the interesting things they do is is they have uh, security training that's essentially – it's like a series of anime-ish cartoons with full-on Hollywood voiceover acting, and they're presenting all of this – all of these potential scenarios um, because, you know, like the t-shirt from DEF CON always said, there is no patch for human stupidity. Fine. It used to be like, oh, you shouldn't have clicked on that link. But now the sophistication, the level, and for me, it's been nuts. All of the different directions that these are coming from. Like I was dealing with a ton of phishing attacks over uh, um, uh, by text message. You know what I mean? And it's, 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 
it's one thing to have the uh, you know to to have the attacks always coming through email, uh, but you know to suddenly have this like your bank is telling you that something has gone wrong, and you're like, <gasps> and then I'm like, wait a minute, you know, and I stop and I go and I type in the URL and I open the app and I check things the way I'm supposed to, not clicking on links, and I'm like, and then I do a little research. I'm like, okay, this is a new vector for attacks, but it is constant and unending, and this is just particularly brutal, and it's. It's hard. I think, you know, I, you know, I said before, it's, you know, breaches are no longer news. They're a fact of life, but sometimes they're extraordinary or the avenues for additional attacks they open up are extraordinary. And it's, yep. you know, this is, you know, this is, this is a hard one to deal with. The, it's another reminder uh, 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 that if you are not expecting a message, even sometimes if you are, but especially right. if you're not expecting a message, uh, treat it with suspicion. Don't click on links and text messages unless you are 100% yeah. sure uh, that it's safe and tell your friends and family the same thing. Hey, folks, yeah, if you have a thought about something on the show, uh, but you don't know our email address, uh, here, send us your second. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, our email address <laughs> is feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com. Patrick Norton is here, of course, which means we need to check in on the state of chip availability. Uh, Patrick, it looks like we have finally switched from a shortage to an official surplus of GPUs, but let's get right hmm. to the heart of the matter. What is still cheap? What is now cheaper? What isn't? And is it time to buy it? Oh, my goodness. So, okay. So, NVIDIA NCO, uh, NCO, NVIDIA CEO Jensen Wang said during the company's Q2 2023 earnings call yesterday or the day before, or whenever that was, that they're dealing with a quote, excess inventory, unquote, of RTX 3000 series GPUs. Um, they're talking about a $1.4 billion miss on quarterly projection because of reduced demand. Um, I have officially promised not to make snarky comments about uh, perhaps underestimating the importance of crypto to uh, NVIDIA sales. So that's as snarky as I'll get. Um, first of all, they're saying they're going to reduce the number of GPUs that sells to the manufacturer. Uh, Wang's also said that NVIDIA is going to price position current products. Um, and it's interesting to look at that, right? Because... Um, Right now, we're seeing, or we have seen, price cuts at the high end. Back in July, there were rumors that a 3090, 3080 MSRPs would be cut. Uh, you know, recently EVGA decided to beat the full-on panic price dropping uh, on 3090s. I, I mean, it was crazy. They cut a thousand dollars off the price of their high-end 3090 Ti cards. Like twenty-two hundred dollars is suddenly twelve hundred dollars. Mm. Now, the EVGA discount was done by a rebate, but still, you know, I was on I think Micro Center yesterday, and I'm looking at 3080 Ti cards selling for a hundred or two hundred dollars less than the twelve hundred dollar MSRP. Less than MSRP. <laughs> uh, 3090 Ti's for literally hundreds less than the, the launch MSRP. And even less than, you know, if, you know, NVIDIA did cut the MSRP by 25% from $2,000 to $1,500, they're still under uh, that $1,500 MSRP. Um, you know, so we were hoping these these price changes would also drop to the more affordable cards. Um, 3070s are selling for $600 right now. That's about $100 over MSRP. 3060s are anywhere from $60 to $130. Uh, $130 over that $329 MSRP. That's a pretty heavy, like 15 to 30% bump over MSRP for kind of the, you know, the, the sweet spot for an affordable card. Um, there were thoughts that Intel's Arc was going to come in this year and provide a really powerful competitor to NVIDIA and AMD at the low end. It seems, I'll just say that NVIDIA's Arc GPU seems to be having challenges on the desktop. Uh, and the other crazy thing that came out is NVIDIA is going to be, re you know, revealing the 4000 series GPUs, uh, the Ada Lovelace architecture for the RTX 4000 series, or at least, quote, new advances of RTX reinventing 3D graphics and gaming uh, at GTC 2022. That's September 20th. So the overall rumor is that. 4000 series is coming as always they'll release it at the high end and boy are they going to push out that 4090 launch or whatever they carve they decide to launch with as long as possible because i think uh their you know resellers are just getting beaten down right now yeah with inventory the high 3000 inventory Inventory is high. PC demand is falling either because people already bought so much stuff during the lockdown that they don't need anything or they're being cautious about spending or they're right. an Ethereum miner that doesn't need it anymore because <laughs> they're going to uh, <laughs> proof of stake. Uh, right. But yeah, that is all having effects. If you want the best deal, should you wait 
for the RTX 4000 announcement? Or is that still only going to be applying at the high end? I think it's going to, you know, the, the, the two sets of rumors I'm looking at, and I'll just flat out say the rumors, is that, you know, most people are saying they're they're not going to release it till 20, you know, late 2022, i.e. they're going to sneak this out in time for holiday shopping. I've seen some less loud rumors, uh, assuming I'm looking in the right places, that say they're going to push it out till 2023. I think NVIDIA is going to try to clear as much inventory as possible because as soon as that 4,000 cards hit the floor, and if they're legitimately as powerful as they're claiming they're going to be, then everybody's going to be like, I don't want a 3,000 series card. They're trash. Um, you know, again, that you know, precludes that they deliver a 4,000 series card that actually delivers advances that we, you know, that, you know, gamers can actually see. I think demand's going to fall through the floor. So I think they're going to push that that launch out as mm-hmm. far as they can. So short answer, keep an eye on those 30, 60, 30, 70s uh, and hold off as long as you can, because I don't I don't really see prices dropping. I think they've already probably cut inventory on those just to kind of keep things a little stiff. Uh, cause that's a, you know, that's a big old chunk of profit for somebody somewhere in that chain. So we'll see yep. where that ends up. All right. Good stuff as always. Let's check Thank out the you. mailbag. Let's do it. This one comes from Nick in Australia. Uh, this was regarding the Amazon a word. <laughs> we know who she is for game story that we talked about on Wednesday. Nick says, I'm not a gamer that's against this concept. In fact, I want it for a f- very specific type of game. There's a piece of software that integrates with most PC racing sims called Crew Chief. Among other features, it allows you to communicate to the games via voice what you want done at a pit stop. For example, fuel 40 liters, change all tires, lower pressure by one bar. The problem is getting Crew Chief to understand you consistently. There's nothing more frustrating than having about 40% of my calls result in a, sorry, please repeat that. If Amazon is successful, says Nick, then more interest from developers should be forthcoming in this area and hopefully the little independent app Crew Chief can employ more powerful speech recognition. Yeah, that's a, that's a good point. If if Amazon does well with this, they will do what they do, uh, like like mm-hmm. with AWS, and they'll democratize it. Uh, they'll make it available for a fee, uh, but they'll try to make it available for as many game companies to implement as possible, it w- would be my guess. Uh, that's usually what Amazon does with its tech, uh, in which case, yeah, Crew Chief could replace their own uh, stuff with, with Amazon's. Of course, this is all assuming that the Amazon stuff works as well or better <laughs> uh, as the stuff in, in Crew Chief, which you know remains to be seen. But it's pretty good at what it does, so I imagine yeah. it, it shouldn't be too disappointing. One would guess. The fact that we have to say a word all the time means it certainly knows it's wake word, and it's not even going to need a wake <laughs> word in games. So. I don't think we've ever <laughs> said called it a word until Nick called it the a word, and I'm like, okay, that's what it is now. Yeah. Alex. Amazon's a word. A lady. Yeah. You know, a word with Tom the Merritt. a lady. <laughs> <laughs> That's what Allison Sheridan calls it. Uh, hey, if you're free Thursday, September 8th at 3 p.m. Eastern Time, I will be on a free and publicly available panel with actual scientists. I don't know why they included me, but I'm happy to be there uh, to talk about how memory makes it harder to fight COVID 19, uh, particularly about how it infects, uh, affects contact tracing. Even when there are apps and other tech, that's actually why I'm there, is to talk about the consumer side and what consumer perception is. The panel is part of the Association for Psychological Sciences Global Collaboration on COVID-19. So if you're interested in this topic, you can get the link from our show notes or head on over to psychologicalscience.org for more. Let's check in with Len Peralta, who has been illustrating today's show. Len, what have you drawn for us today? You know, I don't know how many people know this or not, but I used to work in advertising and I know a good tagline when I hear it. When I hear a Chromebook <laughs> for the face, I just know that is the start of a great idea. So here, look uh, how happy is, they are. This is great. Yes, Who wouldn't want face. a Chromebook for the face with I that mean, it's, presentation? It looks so fun. Those well, hands, well, Len. Those <laughs> hands. <laughs> I was very alien inspired, inspired meta stuff for your face. Come on. That's, 
that just writes itself right there. So uh, if you want to. If you want to check out this image, it's over on my Patreon, patreon.com forward slash Len. It's also at my online store if you like the old timey way of buying stuff, uh, lenperaltastore.com. Also want to mention, I am looking for gigs and commissions, so hit me up if you want that. And also give a listen to my new show, The Back Nine, which just started. And you can uh, listen to another episode next week. I'm working on it this weekend. Thank you. Excellent. Well, you've been busy, Len. Um, Patrick Norton, also always busy because we know you. Uh, let folks know where they can keep up with your latest. Oh, my goodness. If you got questions about headphones or speakers or home theater or televisions or all that good stuff, do me a favor. Go check out AVXL, A-V-E-X-C-E-L on your favorite podcatcher or AVXL.com if you'd like to look for it the old timey way, as Len says. And uh, I'm always at Patrick Norton on the Twitters. If you got a question or want to know what that strange pile of sand is behind my face on that page. <laughs> ah, well, Len and Patrick and the strange pile of sand, we're happy to have you <laughs> as always. Also, we have some brand new bosses to thank. John Ulreich and Chris all just started backing us on Patreon. We Ooh. want to thank you, John. We want to thank you, Ulreich, and we want to thank you, Chris. Thank Man. you. Yeah, you don't know how happy we are to have two straight days of new bosses and three of you, the the a trio, a hat trick. Y'all are the best. Uh, we really appreciate it. So so thank all three of you for that. Indeed. Speaking of patrons, uh, stick around for the extended show, Good Day Internet. If you're a patron, you already know. But if you don't know, you can catch the show live. This this show, DTNS, Monday through Friday at 4 p.m. Eastern, 2000 UTC. Find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. We hope you have a wonderful weekend, everybody, and we'll be back on Monday with Rob DeMillo joining us. This week's episodes of Daily Tech News Show were created by the following people. Host, producer, and writer, Tom Merritt. Host, producer, and writer, Sarah Lane. Executive producer and booker, Roger Chang. Producer, writer, and host, Rich Straffolino. Video producer and Twitch producer, Joe Kuntz. Technical producer, Anthony Lemos. Spanish language host, writer, and producer, Dan Campos. News host, writer, and producer, Jen Cutter. Science correspondent, Dr. Nikki Ackermans. Social media producer and moderator, Zoe Detterding. Our mods, Beatmaster, W. Scott Aswan, BioCow, Captain Kipper, Steve Guadarama, Paul Reese, Matthew J. Stevens, a.k.a. Gadget Virtuoso, and J.D. Galloway. Mod and video hosting by Dan Christensen. Video feed by Sean Way. Music and art provided by Martin Bell, Dan Luters, Mustafa A, Acast, and Len Peralta. Live art performed by Len Peralta. Acast ad support from Tatiana Matias. Patreon support from Dylan Harari. Our contributors on this week's show included Ayaz Akhtar, Chris Ashley, Scott Johnson, Justin Robert Young, Chris Christensen, and Patrick Norton. And thanks to all the patrons who make the show possible. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>